Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to be discussing conjunctions. We've already discussed many of the concepts that we'll be talking about today, but I just want to kind of maybe give a little refresher and uh, maybe uh, connect some dots, so to speak. Um, today we're going to be using, obviously as we always are using, our Aspen Handbook. If you have the green or the third edition, we'll be working on pages 28, 29, and 30. If you have the red or the fourth edition, we'll be working on pages, oops, here we go, wrong one. We'll be working on pages 30, 31, and 32. So if you haven't gotten your book yet, pause me and go get the book and turn me back on when you're ready. So let's begin. I have a little cheat sheet here. I'm not going to post this one because it's really just the stuff that's also in the book. Uh, the first item that we're going to talk about are coordinating conjunctions. We've already talked about coordinating conjunctions when we were talking about the use of commas. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this except to remind you what we've already covered. Of course, the big takeaway here is that coordinating conjunctions are what we call the fanboys. And it's just, that's just a little mnemonic for remembering the, um, I guess there's seven coordinating conjunctions, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Okay, so let's uh, start with a little bit of an, ex so I guess the important thing about the coordinating conjunctions are that they unite equal parts. So they don't demote or promote a particular part. They're um, equal. Um, in the structure of the sentence. And so uh, here we have two sentences. Obviously, because they're sentences, they are um, independent um, clauses, mean they can function as sentences. We have the man ate breakfast, he went to work. Perfectly good sentences. We have a subject here. We have a predicate here. We have a simple subject, man. We have a simple predicate, eight. We're, and we express a complete idea. Here we have another full sentence. We have a subject. The subject is the simple and the complete subject all in one word. And then we have our predicate. And we include our simple predicate wit. We express an entire idea. So we have two independent clauses. We're going to pick a coordinating conjunction. I use an. An is the easiest coordinating conjunction to use. So of course, naturally, I'm doing it the easiest way I can because I'm a little bit lazy. So what you do is you plop that end of that coordinating conjunction between your two sentences. You make this uh, period go away. You uh, replace it with a comma, so the comma goes in front of the coordinating conjunction. And then you, of course, make this not a capital letter, unless it's, uh, unless it's a, say, a proper name, or would you keep it as a capital letter. So we've switched it to the man ate breakfast and he went to work. This was a way, so we have both independent clauses, and we're uniting them with a comma. Uh, but there's other ways of using coordinating conjunctions other than this path, and we're going to look at one here. Here we have an independent clause. It's exactly the same independent clause we had before. So we have our subject, we have our verb, excuse me, we have our uh, predicate, and we have a complete thought. Then we have our and here. But you might notice there's no comma here. Well, let's see why we don't have a comma here. Let's look at our second clause. Our second clause is went to work. That's a perfectly good uh, uh, predicate, uh, but it's lacking a subject. So this subject, I'll put it in blue, has to do double duty. This subject, the man, acts as the subject for a breakfast and also acts as a subject for went to work. If we were to put a comma here, we would be separating our subject from this part of, of our predicate. And we've talked before how we don't want to have a single comma separating our subject from our predicate. So we know we can't have it there. So this is doing double duty in this sense. So that's a, a little way of thinking about why you don't have a comma there. Um, but they're both equal parts of the sentence in terms of, let me go ahead, 
in terms of, of the grammatical structure. We haven't demoted one part over the other part. This is actually a compound predicate, is what we would actually call that grammatically. And each part of the compound predicate is equally valuable. This is actually before we get to the part, the two parts that are combining. So what we're doing here is we're combining ate breakfast and went to work. That's what the and is uniting. And so it's actually uniting the two predicates. So they're peers, they're equal, uh, grammatically speaking. And so uh, we call them uniting uh, peers. But you could use another word. We could say, the man ate breakfast or went to work. Of course, this implies he's only did one. Or we could say the man ate breakfast, so he went to work. We could say the man ate breakfast, but he went to work. That doesn't exactly make sense, but okay, whatever. Now, obviously, it's important that you pick the, the coordinating conjunction that makes sense in, in the context. So that's an overview about how, how coordinating conjunctions work. Let me just give one more example. Um, <clears throat> Molly will buy margarine, butter, or canola oil. She only needs one of these, so we're saying or here. These are equals in the sentence because margarine is one of the options. I'll put that in gray. Butter is another option. That's in gray. Canola oil is in another is another option. That's in gray. So this or, which is our fanboys here, is uh, bringing conjoining these three items. It would be wrong to think of Molly will buy margarine as one of the three parts. Molly will buy let me just make this go away, isn't part of what is being conjoined by the or, just these three peers. Okay, now we're going to talk briefly about correlative conjunctions. They are really basically coordinating conjunctions, except instead of having just one conjunction, there's actually, they're done in pairs, so that's how they correlate. They work in pairs, but they join equals, and you may recall up here, coordinating conjunctions join equal parts. Let me actually change that to join equal parts. So we say, Molly both loves theater and golfing. Okay, so you can see we use both and the word an. And so, let's see, here we go. Let's see, actually I should say an loves golfing. Actually, let's do it this way. Loves both theater and golfing. Okay, so we have our conjunctions, but I'm going to put these in yellow. And then they are joining together theater, let me use the typical American spelling here, and golfing. Right. Now you might say, well, we could write this, I changed Ollie to Molly, I guess we can make it Ollie, but we'll stick with Molly. Okay, I could have said it this in a different way. I could have said Molly loves theater and golfing. Now, of course, we're not using a correlative conjunction. We're using a coordinating conjunction. We're using one of our fanboys. Um, this is obviously grammatically correct. We're, unite, we're uniting theater and golfing by using our fanboys here. Um, but even though both of these sentences are completely grammatically correct, um, they have a slightly different meaning. It is a very subtle difference, uh, not, nothing to get too worked up about. But what we're doing here is we're emphasizing it's not just one interest. We're not just giving a list of the interests that Molly has, but we're trying to emphasize that um, 
both of these speak to Molly. So we're looking at them, you know, at the same time. We're not just listing some things. So we're emphasizing um, their connection with, with respect to Molly. Okay. Molly will attend Collin College or um, uh, we'll say um, University of Texas at Dallas. Okay, so this time I've used again a fanboys and I'm uniting Collin College with University of Texas at Dallas. She's not going to attend both. It's going to be Collin College is one possibility or the University of Texas at Dallas. It's not both and it's not neither. I could add either here. Now we're using a correlative conjunction. So we have either or uh, and then we're, we're uniting Collin College and University of Texas at Dallas. Of course we could make this neither nor. Here of course we mean that she, um, let's say we'll just say she will be attending University of North Texas, okay? Mary will attend neither Collin College nor University of Texas at Dallas. And of course the next statement proves that fact. She'll be attending another university, but we're saying here she's not attending here. Oh yeah, she's also not attending here. So we're using correlative conjunctions to uh, correlate, to conjoin those two words. Okay, let's move on to subordinating conjunctions. This is one topic we haven't spent a lot of time talking about. We mainly talked about these when we were talking about introductory clauses. Um, so let's first of all talk about what subordinating means. You're probably familiar with the term subordinate. A subordinate in you know everyday conversation means um, someone in a lower position with respect to another. So for example, if if Bob Bob Bob's boss is Larry, Bob is Larry's subordinate. Okay? Um, so it has a lower position, a weaker status, you could say. Um, so when we say something is subordinating another person, we're saying that it is essentially demoting this person. So this is maybe Bob used to be Larry's peer in the organization. They both had the same position. But the big boss has come in and has subordinated Bob. And he's telling Bob, Bob, I am demoting you. Instead of Larry being your peer, Larry is now your boss. So a subordinating conjunction demotes, let me go ahead and this for the page, demotes the clause that it is attached to. Here are some examples of subordinating clauses. This is not an exhaustive list. So um, the fanboys list is exhaustive, but this is not. After, although, because, before, if, once, since, unless, until, when, where, while. These are in alphabetical order. So what are some important things? We've talked about the independent clauses when we were up here. We talked about how an independent clause can be a freestanding sentence, and we talked about the three things that an independent clause has to have. It has to have a subject, has to have a predicate, which has to, and always predicates have to include a verb, and it has to express a complete thought, okay? Um, but uh, when we look, and that's, so that's what we have with an independent clause. But um, what a dependent clause um, has going on is that it's missing one or more of those elements. Sometimes it inherently is missing those elements. Let me give you an example. After the rain, the rainbow appeared. Okay. Okay. 
we can see that this is an independent clause. We have our subject, our complete subject. Our simple subject is rainbow. And we have our complete predicate, which is also the simple predicate, the verb, appeared. And we have a complete idea, the rainbow appeared. That could be a freestanding sentence. Then we have our subordinating conjunction. But we can see that um, it is not actually um, having a whole sentence here. It's just um, uh, a, an idea. But we can also have a complete sentence, as we do in this case. So let's look at this. We started out, and you may recall these two sentences from before, when we were doing coordinating conjunctions. The man ate breakfast, he went to work. And then we took these two independent clauses, joined them together as equals using a fan voice. Now we're going to take those same sentences, the man ate breakfast, he went to work, and we're going to join them using a subordinating conjunction. So as you can see, both a coordinating conjunction and a subordinating conjunction are, you know, conjunctions. They conjoin. They join. They bring those two together. So we would had two sentences, and at the end of the day, we're going to have one sentence. They're going to be in the same sentence, and they're going, we're going to show the relationship between those ideas by what conjunction we select. Um, but instead of them being peers, like Larry and Bob were initially, uh, one is going to have a subordinate function, okay? So I've done it both ways. And usually you can demote either one of the sentences, or the, 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 sen the initial sentences that you want to. I've chosen for the first example to demote our first sentence. After the man ate breakfast, he went to work. And you can see all I did was I put after in front of what used to be an independent clause. Obviously I had to put the, the T and the lowercase. I removed the period, replaced it with a comma, and put the uh, put the H in a lowercase, and we have this um, uh, independent clause. And you can see this is still independent, has all the elements that we have. It still has our subject, it still has our predicate, it still expresses a complete idea. Now you might be saying, well, Groover, yeah, this is still an independent clause, but Gosh, so is this. I mean, you didn't change anything. This is, still has all the parts. It still has a subject. It still has a predicate. It still expresses a complete idea. And you're absolutely right. If we took away the after, we would have an independent clause. But once we put the after in, and we're looking at this as a unit, we recognize that it doesn't express a complete thought. Let's say um, I start a conversation with you, and I say, after the man ate breakfast. Do you feel like I'm done? <laughs> no. You want to know, okay, what happened next? I mean, I'm, I'm building up to something. I haven't completed it. Um, this is like a cliffhanger. After the man ate breakfast, he murdered his family. He brushed his teeth. He read the paper. He died of a heart attack. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen next, but clearly something momentous is about to happen, and you haven't told me what it was. And so even though it has a subject, and even though it has a predicate, the part that fails is that it doesn't express a complete thought. We're not ready for a period here, and the only impediment is this word after because this word after tells you there's going to be more coming just wait it's going to be good okay so this after has subordinated this formerly independent clause so i chose initially to subordinate this clause but i could have just as easily subordinated this clause let's look at how i might do that the man ate breakfast so again we have our first sentence Really, it's just the same. We have all the parts. We have the man, the subject. We have the predicate. We have a complete idea. We've gotten rid of the period, and now we've added a subordinating conjunction. We can see it's right here on our list. We, I changed the H to a lowercase h, and I'm ready to go. The man ate breakfast before he went to work. Okay? Either one is grammatically correct. They actually both mean the same thing in this case. The only um, difference other than um, the uh, uh, particular subordinating conjunction I use is, is this whole comma thing. 
when you put the subordinating clause first, you need to have a comma before the independent clause. If you put the independent clause first, you don't put a comma here. Um, this is a pretty common error because people are, are used to kind of thinking on some level, it's usually not necessarily that they know all the names for this or even wouldn't they have been able to exactly say why they're doing it, but they've seen this pattern lots of times. And so they start thinking, well, I've seen this before, so surely I'm supposed to put a comma here. But no, we're not supposed to. Uh, I think you can hear a bit of a difference. After the man ate breakfast, he went to work. The man ate breakfast before he went to work. There's less of a pause here typically. So that might be a justification for why you might put a comma here in this sentence, but not in this sentence. Um, but whether you agree with it or think there's a difference or not it really isn't here or there. It's just a grammar rule, one to know, because uh, this is our introductory clause rule. And obviously, this isn't introductory. It's at the end, so we don't put a comma there. Okay, let's move to our last topic. And this isn't completely uh, related. Uh, in fact, it's not really related at all, but the, the textbook puts it in at this point, so let me go ahead and flag it. This is the word however. However has a complicated history in English. Um, I'm not going to go through the reasons that uh, there's kind of two, well, there, there's, I would say, three schools of thought about this. Um, there are two ways that we use the word however, at least two ways that we use the word however in English. And um, one way that we use it, so I'll call this A, so um, reason A, reason A. There are two schools of thought. One group says, don't put it at the beginning of a sentence. Others say, you can put it at the beginning of a sentence. So there's two schools of thought here. Some say, yep, it's okay. Some say, uh-uh, that's wrong, don't do it. There's a reason B. And I think all grammatic grammarians agree you can put it at the beginning of a sentence. So you um you may think that and what I'm going to recommend that you do is you never start a sentence with however. Now you just said, but Gruber, you just said some people think you can, even with this reason. And then everybody agrees you can do it with this other reason, so why are you stopping us from doing it? Let me explain. Um, the older the person is, which means, you know, we're talking judge age or senior partner age, the more likely that he or she grew up with this rule, because this used to be really common. It's less common now. But, um, you know, there's a fair number of people who would uh, still take this to heart. And guess what? You can't look at somebody and know whether they believe this or believe that. So why take a risk? I mean, it's not like these people down here think you have to start a sentence with however. Nobody's ever going to get mad at you if you put this the however somewhere else. So you might tick off these people, but there's nothing you can do with your however that's going to tick off this group. And since especially these people are likely to be in positions of authority, let's assume your audience is this category of people. Now, it is true that if you're using, however, the second way, which is less common, you can put it anywhere. But even if you decide to diagnose which one of the howevers you're using, still, there are people out there that aren't grammar nerds. <laughs> um, and who just remember, oh, you're never supposed to put however in the beginning of the sentence. They learned that much from their grade school teacher, and that stuck. But they don't remember the difference between reason A and reason B. So even if you're using it completely correctly, and every single grammar nerd in the country would say, yep, you did the right thing, you are awesome, the fact remains that there will be some people who only remember this rule, and when they see you do it, even when you're absolutely justified in doing it, they will think you're wrong. So, why risk it? 
Why even go there? It's never necessary to start a sentence with however. So yes, you could do it and you would be sitting on the high, high ground. You could laugh at those silly people who don't know any better, except you know what, if it's the judge, um, probably not so good to, to, to show him up. And the reality is, is that even if you um, do show somebody up, you won't even know if you did or you didn't. It's not like he's going to come to you and say, well, you know, you put however at the beginning of your sentence, and I know that's wrong, and so that's why I didn't award your motion or whatever. I mean, that's not literally the thought process that the judge is going to follow, and he's never going to say or she's never going to say that was the reason or even I noticed it. It may not even consciously register with that legal professional um, that you did that, but it's some somewhere in the deep recesses of his or her mind that hey, you're not supposed to do that, and so there's no reason to take that risk. So I'm not even going to explain to you the reason A and the reason B. I'm just going to say to you, just don't do it. Now, if you see other people mis put however at the beginning of the sentence, and even though um, I've told you not to do it, please realize that it doesn't mean that they're Neanderthals <laughs> or some subhuman form of life. Because, number one, they might be using reason B, or they might have grown up in a reason A era where they've been told, hey, it's okay to do that. So don't judge people who, who start a sense with however. I'm just recommending for your benefit that that's probably not the best career move ever. So let me show you the, the, the way that I'm recommending you not do. Bob had committed many crimes. However, he was truly repentant. This is not favored. Let's look at the an, a more favored way. Bob had committed many crimes. He, however, was truly repentant. You could also move, however, here. Let me just try to show you a different way. He was, however, truly repentant. Oops, I guess I have the wrong color, don't I? Okay. So let's look at it. Let's say, so let's say you choose to put however in the middle. This is an interruptive. You remember the uh, comma rule for that. So we need to bracket it with a comma. So the word in front of however is going to have a comma. And then immediately after however, we're going to have a comma. If for some reason you choose not to follow this rule that I'm, I'm at, suggesting you follow, and you want to start your sentence with however, then you would obviously need to capitalize it, and then you would put the comma immediately after however. Um, I think most people disfavor putting however at the end of the sentence, but let me just show you how you would do that. Um, so I'm, I'm not recommending this. So let me just move this one. So we're going to put a comma here, and then however, and then a period. And obviously, when it, wherever you have a, you're up against a period, you're not going to put a comma right in front of it. So um, this is the rule that we've seen elsewhere, where we um, put um, when we start a sentence, something that we'd ordinarily put between two commas. When we start the sentence, we're just going to end it with a comma. And if we put it, put whatever that item is at the end of the sentence, we're going to put a comma right, right in front of it. So um, that gives you an overview about the use of however. Um, so that can be a helpful thing to keep yourself on track. Let me just see if there's any other things. Okay, yeah, we haven't talked about uh, many traditional writers dislike the use of coordinating conjunction at the beginning of the sentences. Um, this is becoming more common um, to allow con coordinating conjunctions at the beginning of the sentence. It's a little bit like the however situation, though. Um, there's never a need to do it. Let me just show you what that would look like. I'm going to go back to... I'm going to take these sentences. 
So this is an example of how that might work. The man ate breakfast. So this is our initial version. Now I'm going to show you with the coordinating conjunction. And he went to work. That's how we would punctuate it. Um, this is not favored by some people. But I don't think it is as likely, I don't know, it is probably maybe a little bit more acceptable than the use of however at the beginning of sentences. But there's still a lot of people that say that's too informal for legal writing. So I don't recommend that. I mean, after all, you don't have to do that. You could just, you know, do that. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if in the not too distant future this became more acceptable schema. I will tell you when people do this um, and decide to make this choice, number one, I would say probably don't do it. But if you decide that you're going to do this, don't do this. Don't put a comma here. Lots of people want to. What, what you're doing is you're thinking, well, I got to put a comma somewhere. I know that about and. I can't put a comma here because I already have a period. And I, I don't want to make this into one long sentence. So I'm going to put it here. No. Remember when we were up here, we put a comma before and, not after and. So when you are putting a coordinating conjunction at the beginning of the sentence, you don't put a comma afterwards. And then another reason why people don't like the coordinating conjunction at the beginning of the sentence is that it's, it's going to create a temptation for you to create a sentence fragment. I'm not going to talk about all the sentence fragment stuff. That's a separate um, lesson. So this is an example where the author put, um, he pat appeared, he used but, he did not put a comma here, so that was good. But that's not, that's a, that disfavored role. We're starting a sentence with, a, with the fanboys, and that's not a good idea. So here the author revised by putting a comma here, lowercase b, no comma here. And then here, um, this comma, I would say, is not a good idea. I'm going to reject the use of that comma. I'm going to disagree with the textbook. We've already talked about correlative conjunctions. I don't like the way these rules are stated, and I'm not going to test you over it in this class. Um, we will cover this um, if you, well, actually, let me say it this way. If you're watching this video and you are in advanced legal documents preparation, you're not responsible for knowing this information. If you're in legal uh, writing, I will cover this information separately and in a different format, and you uh, will be responsible for it. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, this is another um, thing to keep in mind. Actually, I think that's okay. I won't talk about that. So I think we're done um, with the topic of conjunctions. Thank you for your attention. Of course, if you have any questions, um, feel free to come to my office hours or um, uh, talk with me before or after class. Have a good day.